My name is Donald Paul, Humanities Faculty from Gateway Community College. And as we typically do, we have a short pre-show conversation for the film. Today what I'm going to do is talk about the genre a little bit. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I may or may not be able to answer. I have some trivia here for you. Hopefully it will be interesting for you. And then we'll go on with the show. And we're going to hear some organ music from the incomparable Ron Road. And then following that, I'll talk about the film specifically for a couple of minutes and then watch the film. Great. Let's talk about the Western. It's somewhat arbitrary. Because if you were a settler in Long Island or around Boston a few hundred years ago, the West to you was upstate New York. Maybe Pennsylvania, Ohio, forget it, you're not going that far. The University of Michigan has a fight song. One of the lines in the fight song is Champions of the West. Isn't Chicago west of Michigan? Go Blue. Go Blue, yeah. Mm -hmm. My boys. Hopefully they've got a football coach now. Now, so, where is the West? The West typically is west of the Mississippi, more of the Mid-Southwest area. Uh, tonight we're going to watch a Western. And I really don't like it when people say silence is a, is a genre or a category. Silent films were about one-third of all the film history. Film began in 1894. So, when you look at what kind of films do you like? Can I be watching the Western? Maybe it's horror, maybe it's comedy, maybe it's a romantic film, maybe it's a war film, maybe it's suspense. Those are all categories of films, those are all genres. And every genre has four stages. The first stage of a genre is called the primitive stage. All right, come on, give them a chance. They're just starting out, they don't really know what they're doing yet. So, a primitive example of a Western film would be 1903's The Great Train Robber. Uh, it was an okay story, they made some mistakes, but give them a chance. The next stage of any genre is called the classical, hey, they got it down. And that was 1939's Stagecoach, directed by John Ford, starring John Wayne. They really had the characters down, the story was tight, very nice. You tell a classic, uh, story in the genre. Now what are you going to do? It, Donald, it was perfect. Now where do I go? Well, now where you go is that you go to the stage that's called revisionist. You look at it and you look at it from a different point of view. So that's 1952's High Noon with Gary Cooper. Who's good? Who's bad? Who's wearing the white hat? Who's wearing the black hat? Are the townspeople supportive or not? And then you start to see Maybe good and evil, and, and, and not just the good guys and the bad guys, but maybe even some of the townspeople. You go to that and say, all right, Donald, we, we, it's perfect, we revised it, now what do you do? Well, you know what you do on the fourth stage? That's called parodic, it's a parody. Now let's make fun of everybody. That's the next stage. And that example is 1974's Blazing Saddles, where they just make fun of the whole Western genre. So those are the four stages. Now, let's look at the elements of a Western. Look at the characters, the good guy, the bad guy. Oh, help me, the stereotypic woman that needs some help, which probably doesn't do too well today. And look at some of even the revisionist westerns with maybe the strength of a uh, Native American woman. Look at some of the stereotypes that we have of uh, Native Americans, probably Navajo in this film. The speech, don't talk too much. The more you talk, the weaker you are. And what dominates a Western? You know what dominates the Western? Forget about the stars. I'll talk a little bit about them. But they're nothing compared to the background, the visuals, that wide open space. Look when you even watch the Clint Eastwood movies. You see him, he looks like a little ant. And that whole landscape dominates. So when you watch this film, not too much looking at the characters or even that kind of, I don't want to say a ham, but the horse is kind of a ham. Eh? We have a horse that kind of steals a show. Don't even look at the horse so much. Look at the backgrounds. Um, now, this film was made in 1925. Let's take a look at what was going on in 1925. Some of the things. And I'll tell you why I selected these. The Chrysler Corporation is found. The first motel opens up. And the reason I chose these two is because that tells you something about the diminishing West that with the cars and the 
expansion and people going all over the place, and it just it ruins that pristine nature of the West. Um, Phantom of the Opera was playing at the time, so that's a heavy competition. And oh, well, there's a horse in here, there's a scary person in Phantom of the Opera, and then you've got Rin Tin Tin, a dog, so you have to figure out what do you like, horror, a dog, or a horse? Uh, Tony Curtis was born. How much do you guys think the uh, house in Texas cost, eight room house cost in 1925? Any guesses? $3,200. That's about what it costs right now with this economy. I don't want to say anything negative, so we'll move on. To uh, electric toaster was $675. And, and then a men's silk line suit, $50. And one last thing, Earl Wise. Because on East Coast, uh, we used to have Wise potato chips from a nickel. Earl Wise invented the potato chip. Any questions yet? I'll just keep going then. All right, let's talk about Zane Gray. This is a Zane Gray novel that was turned into a film. Let's talk about Zane Gray for a little bit. He was born in Zanesville, Ohio, one of his relatives it was named for. He was born in 1872, died in 1939. As a kid, he fought a lot, and he got into a lot of fights, so his, his dad whooped him a little bit, quite a bit actually. He ended up playing baseball, he got a scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania to play baseball. He ended up becoming a dentist and being a dentist in New York. Finally, he started traveling to the West and hanging out with some cowboys, and they would tell them stories. Plus, he would go west, and sometimes he would go west on some hunting trips. And that's where he got a lot of his ideas. He wrote over 60 books. The very popular Writers of the Purple Sage is one of his most famous. Um, oh, in Payson, we have his Zane Gray cabin. It was unfortunate that in 1992, it burned during the Dude Fire. And one of the people, I think it was either the son or a relative of the people that built the original cabin up around Payson wanted to get involved, and so they have a reconstruction now up there so that you could enjoy that. The stars. Let's look at Jack Holt as uh, Chain Waver. He was born in New York, 1888, lived to be uh, to 1951. He started at VMI, and he was supposed to be an engineer. So you, here's the star of the movie, and the writer. You, you got an engineer and a dentist. How, how do you get a Western out of that? It's mm -hmm. funny how people start. Uh, he became a ranch hand in Oregon, and then he saw in the paper that in San Francisco, hey, they're doing a cowboy movie, they need somebody to jump off a cliff 30 feet with a horse. Anybody, any takers? He took it, and he broke two ribs, and the director said, eh, it's not bad, you're right, why don't you come back to Hollywood? He said, it's pretty good, the, the money, and that's how he got into uh, films. He enlisted in World War II, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., who was also in this film, was involved with that too, and the there's so many films, I, I, I can't go through all of them, but the thing that I like about Jack Holt is, again, he transitioned from silence to talkies. A lot of people couldn't make that transition. He was in the film They Were Expendable, uh, a World War II movie. That's one of the movies I like. Uh, he did over 100 movies. His son, Tim Holt, made the remake of Wild Horse Mesa in 1947. His son also starred with um, Humphrey Bogart in Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and he actually had a cameo role in that. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. as his brother, Chess Wagner, 1909 to 2000. He acted for about 81 years. Yeah, he was a famous acting family, so he's got his dad, and then his stepmom, Mary Pickford. Uh, and the other thing of note I'd like to mention is that he did marry when he was a kid. He married Joan Crawford, but it was all about her and the movie star, so it didn't last very long. We also have Noah Beery as Bud McPherson. He was 1882 to 1946. Probably don't want to know too much about him. Let's talk about his brother. His brother was so spoiled and rotten, such a brute. Uh, it was in 1931, 1931 for the champ. They found out, he found out, he didn't win the Academy Award. Frederick March did. And he came in and had a temper tantrum in the office. And they said, okay, okay, it's kind of close. So they gave him an Academy Award. And it was, they called it a tie, which was not fair. And his, bro his brother went ahead and beat up some comic, and I suppose they killed him. And they kind of hushed it up. Uh, played villains a lot of times. He's playing a villain here. And his father was a cop in Kansas City. So there are some things about the film. Any uh, questions? Background? Westerns? So I, I want to I say one thing about the 
depiction of characters, I know sometimes we have some uh, cinema students here too, look at this as far as what are the elements, look at how the women act. And those are stereotypes. Maybe some women act that way, not all women, so you don't want to stereotype. Is she strong? Is she weak? Oh, I'm wrong, just stop and I'll marry you. <laughs> the women at my college, they wouldn't have any of that. That's very strong. It's all I can do to have any control in my classroom. So, that's not. And I actually went to high school on the Navajo Reservation, Chinle High, one year. Think of Brooklyn with a school with a number going to the Navajo Reservation. Amazing uh, change. And my mom worked for the tribe. And I've dealt with, and I've had a lot of ex some experience with Navajo women. And you're going to see a woman, uh, a Native American woman in this film. And you look at the stereotypic notion or the strength. I've talked to, uh, we made a film with one of my students, and I asked her, she was such a ham, I said, will you miss Navajo Nation? And she said, no, but my mother was. I said, I knew it was somewhere in there. And let me tell you something about what a real Native American woman uh, is expected to do. When they have the uh, Miss Navajo Nation, you think, oh, it's Miss America, get up there, you're all hot in a bikini, uh-uh. You're wearing your traditional dress, you have to know all kinds of things, and you get a big knife in your hand, and you have to share that cheek. So, there's some tough women there, so you know, how, how the movie depicts those people is not really the truth. One more minute. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and transition to our organ concert, and then after the organ concert, I'm going to go ahead and say a few words about the film, and go from there. Thank you.